Well, hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us for the Division 18 Town Hall today, focused on APA's advocacy initiatives and public service psychology. Our guest today is Catherine McGuire, who is APA's Chief Advocacy Officer. And so before I um, turn the mic over to Catherine, I'm going to give a brief introduction um, so you know who she is. So first off, Catherine McGuire is APA's first chief advocacy officer who is responsible for implementing a unified strategic vision for the association's government relations efforts and coordinating APA's broader advocacy initiatives in non-governmental sectors. With more than 25 years of senior level policy experience in Congress, the executive branch and the private sector, McGuire was most recently Assistant Secretary for Congressional and Intergovernmental Affairs at the U.S. Department of Labor. In that post, she focused on appropriations, budget priorities, and regulatory matters. Before joining the Department of Labor, McGuire served five years in the House of Representatives advising on science and technology issues. And prior to that, she spent five years as Vice President for Government Affairs at the Business Software Alliance. She also served almost 18 years in the U.S. Senate, where she held numerous senior leadership roles. It's such a, an honor to have you a part of APA, but also you and your team have just done some outstanding work um, for us um, in public service psychology and APA um, in psychology um, at large. So. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you so much, Tiffany. And, and thank you for the invitation to uh, speak to all the members of Division 18. Um, we, we can't get our work done and, and do it without the partnership that we have with, with all of you and all the sections. Um, so we, we just wanted to say from the very beginning um, uh, how, how much we just appreciate all, all the work that you do with us. Um, Together, I think we're we're making the world better. Um, so, with that, I I'm just going to uh, jump right in to today's uh, advocacy update. Um, there are going to be four parts that I'm going to talk about um, today as we go through the um, the presentation. The first is I'm going to talk about the shifting political landscape. Then I'm going to talk about mental health legislative uh, actions and activities that are that are ongoing in Congress. I then am going to shift a little bit to talk about how we work. And that is just to give uh, Division 18 and its members a little bit more of kind of that secret sauce or behind the curtain insights into how the advocacy office works uh, to maximize its reach and its impact. And then uh, last but not least, uh, I'm gonna really uh, do a little bit of a spotlight on some of our, our activities uh, with you where we have partnered across the, across the division, uh, things that are very much um, uh, live at this point in time, and, and then do any kind of Q&As if, if people are, are up to that and would, would like to do that. So let, let's just jump in, shifting political landscape. Uh, you can see this seismic, seismic shift, this chasm that's uh, staring us in the eye there. Um, we politically in this country, as well as our advocacy team here, are still facing the convergence of multiple forces. Um, and when I say we're facing multiple forces, there are so many really hard, hard issues, societal issues that, that are present at once. It's, it is unusual to have so many of those issues present at once. And when you have so many issues that society is working its way through, trying to get a better understanding, trying to, I mean, we're, we're, we, we as a nation have a little bit of an identity crisis. Um, being a 50-50 nation, as we have been, we've been locked in this 50-50 political split for some time. Blue is bluer, red is redder. And that combined with the convergence of racism and gender inequality, climate change, income, growing income in inequality, um, the just ongoing uh, COVID-19 pandemic that just is lingering and refuses to leave us, um, combined with economic recovery and the pressures and inflation. Um, and then on top of that, I mean, the, the record levels of violence and gun violence, um, 
the the uh, abortion uh, decisions and 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 um, reproductive rights issues that are before this country in the Supreme Court. And on top of that, just the just the, the ghastly news uh, that we've just hit another high in fentanyl and uh, methamphetamine and opioid deaths this year. Um, those kinds of things all together uh, really um, pose uh, challenges for policymakers. Um, quite frankly, they're just not accustomed to trying to get their arms around such big problems that are that are, uh, and as we call it, syndemic, getting their, uh, getting their arms around a syndemic um, at once. Uh, the other things that are part of the, the shifting political landscape that we're, we're working our way through right now are the, the new um, fiscal 23, uh, 2023 appropriations. And you'll recall that we are coming off uh, a series of emergency or pandemic packages, COVID-19, uh, related packages um, that were absolutely needed to, to ensure that our, our country and, and our communities and the people in our communities um, uh, were supported um, during the pandemic. And what we're, what we're starting to see is kind of those uh, gears coming a little bit to a, a little bit of a grinding halt. We're, we're seeing some fiscal, um, uh, a little bit of austerity starting to kick in where there's more scrutiny on both sides, both the Republicans and the Democrats and are starting to look in, and look at the kind of the balance sheet and say, oh my gosh, you know, can, can we afford this? Um, that is not necessarily a great thing, uh, especially at a time when we have been able to collectively uh, elevate mental and behavioral health to the highest offices in the country. It's on the front burner, it's on everybody's minds and policymakers' minds. And yet, um, with all that talk, we're we're also faced with these uh, possible limitations on on actually um, adding new programs or or addressing the you know the problems in in new and innovative ways. And then, last but not least, and uh, I just saved it for last because I thought there was a there was a lot of uh, kind of sad news at the beginning, but the midterm elections. Oh my gosh, we we are in the midst of it. Um, for, for the decades that I have uh, been working in and around Congress, uh, we, uh, in order to uh, keep our wits about us and to be the, uh, be the optimists that we need to be every day, we, we, we sometimes just call it the silly season. Um, it is a season of, of a time when, you know, people are just unpredictable, where things just get topsy-turvy. Um, lawmakers who you had predicted would do one thing, do a complete other thing. And uh, where we are right now is that the, the Congress um, and the country really is in a struggle for the, you know, the control of the House of Representatives and the Senate. And uh, it, could, it could still go both ways um, with all the social issues that are in play and being debated down at the state level, as well as what's happening in Washington. Um, Things could be a lot different come, you know, come November, where the 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 House of Representatives could could actually flip and flip to, as we say, flip could change hands to Republican control, um, and that in itself could be uh, a challenge for uh, psychology and many of the the issues and and and. I guess our 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 vision, uh, which is very well informed by psychological science, but for our vision for for society. Next slide, Alex. So let's talk about the mental health package, um, and we call it a package. A package uh, uh, is vernacular for a uh, a collection of bills, and uh, the House and the Senate are both looking at moving. Uh, mental health, uh, behavioral health type legislation. The Senate is where we've been doing uh, quite a bit of our work. Um, as you can see here, we, we talk about how COVID-19 and the pandemic really triggered um, uh, the mental and behavioral health, health crisis on top of, of the crises that, that we were already um, addressing or trying to address in this country. Um, when I talked about mental health being on the front burner, since February of this year, Congress has had eight plus, I think we're, I, it says eight plus, but I think we're up to 13, we're up to 13 House and Senate hearings on mental health. It's, it's kind of the theme of the day. Everybody wants it. Um, 
I have I've often said that one of the kind of that tipping point in legislation is that you want to be on the front burner, but once everybody starts having hearings on it, um, it, it kind of run the risk of, uh, of of it becoming a kind of a bumper sticker or a slogan where people start using it more in their political speech, like they're all for it, everybody wants to be for it. And the challenges that we are having with everybody all of a sudden being for uh, supporting individuals and communities and everything else that's associated with the ecosystem of, of mental health in this country is that uh, we're, we're finding that they're, they're, they don't necessarily, because of the budget press, pressures, have maybe the appetite to match up with the, uh, the way they're talking about the narrative. Um, the good news is that out of those 13 so far, we've, we've been able to have four psychologists included. And that, that's, that's huge. Um, you can see here that we, that Dr. Wisdom Powell testified before the House Ways and Means Committee on February 2nd. Um, and Dr. Powell is a minority fellow. She was part of the minority fellowship program um, in the past. And then we have uh, Dr. Mitch Princeton, who is our chief science officer, um, who uh, since that hearing um, has continued to be at the forefront of of uh, bringing the science to talk about uh, youth mental health. We have been doing our best to keep Congress's eye on the youth um, in, in the debate that's going on. Um, Congress uh, is hoping that these are gonna be bipartisan packages. Uh, the House, when we look at the House, uh, things feel like they could maybe become a little bit more partisan, except that there's still a lot of, uh, I, we call it sharing of credit where the bills are still uh, moving forward in a way that, you know, kind of a Republican is able to pass their bill and a Democrat pass their bill. Um, not sure if those bills are actually gonna go forward and do anything, um, but the, sun, the Senate is where the real action is. And that's where we've been able to really spend time um, not only uh, crafting legislation, actually writing uh, the legislation that's being considered, um, but also have put ourselves in a position of being a real resource on the subject matter. And that's something that we have worked uh, very hard to do over the last couple of years. Alex, next slide. Um, just so everyone knows uh, that the targeted areas of this uh, mental health package uh, and going back to where we have been really focusing our efforts, especially with the Senate. Um, first and foremost, we are concentrating on strengthening the mental health care workforce. Medicare reimbursement for psychology interns and residents and Medicare is, is one of those. And I'll talk a little bit more, more about that in a minute because I know that's something you're all interested in. Uh, also legislation um, that would allow psychologists to practice independently in all settings. That is, that's something we're still pushing. Uh, it just, it, it takes time to educate new staffers, new members, find, find champions, but those, there, there's good movement in those areas. We're also um, having a, a greater focus on improving prevention and early intervention for youth. Um, that includes expanding access to school and campus-based mental health services and targeting community-based funding to prevention, early detection, early intervention efforts. And in that, in that regard, um, we are at a point where we have been able to carve out what we call a set-aside, which is a percentage of, of one of the big block grants to be used for early, uh, I mean, prevention and early intervention. Uh, the other two areas are, are integration of primary and behavioral health care. Uh, and we advocate for legislating, um, uh, 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 we advocate for legislation that supports all models of evidence-based integrated care, including what they call the, you know, collaborative care model, as well as the um, primary care behavioral health model and, and other hybrid models. Uh, we are we're still pushing for stronger enforcement uh, of mental health parity laws, and we are pushing for uh, increased support for youth mental health research. Next slide. Um, just a little bit about the uh, Medicare reimbursement for psychology interns and residents, because I know um, Tiffany had said that there was interest in, in hearing a little bit more about that. At, at our um, uh, March advocacy summit, uh, one of the, uh, uh, we call them the asks, but one of, one of the issues that the advocates went to Capitol Hill 
and advocated for was Medicare reimbursement for psychology interns and residents. And um, the, the interesting thing about where we are with that is that we wouldn't be where we are with, without uh, the advocates and the work that they did during the summit. Um, Senator Barrasso's office, uh, he's the Senator from Wyoming, um, is actually working on draft legislation that would support uh, reimbursement. And uh, his interests directly came from Wyoming uh, psychologists uh, spending time with him and advocating uh, for the change. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, the, the, the Wyoming psychologists were very impressive. They had actually done a lot of homework um, within the state, had contacted different uh, 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 areas of the state so that they, uh, as well as um, train uh, places where um, the, like the University of Wyoming that would offer or actually host trainees. Um, and so they were, they, they'd done their homework. So they were actually able at the point in time of the needing to answer any question that Senator Barrasso had. Um, now we're, we've got the legislation written and we are hard at work to find a Democrat co-sponsor uh, for bipartisan introduction. Alex is here. Alex has been, uh, Alex Ginsburg, she's our senior director of congressional affairs. She leads our team on all appropriations and very importantly on all of the workforce um, programs and issues. And uh, she's, she's trying to round up uh, Senator Bennett from Colorado. Hopefully we're gonna, we're gonna be able to bring him along um, and may, may need some of your help in doing that. Uh, so we're gonna keep you posted on those efforts. Uh, um, one last thing I'll note is that it is highly unusual to go from a summit to within 10 days, we had uh, a bill drafted from scratch with Senator Barrasso. And again, I'll just double down on, on the results there. Uh, they, are, they simply come from the partnership that we have had with advocates like yourself and in doing the, the great constituent work that you can do as constituents of those, of those members in those states and combining with our efforts. So we, we again, uh, can't do our work without the partnerships we have with you. Next slide. Um, I thought we'd just pause here a little, uh, just for a minute, and talk about how APA services advocacy uh, is meeting this, this moment. Um, as, as many of you know, there's, there have been a lot of changes in, in advocacy in, in, over the three years that, that I've been here. Um, we have really moved in, in different ways to become a lot more sophisticated uh, in the inter integrated approach that we're taking. So the, the four big ways um, that we have, that we have um, kind of marked for concentrating on how, how we're gonna be moving forward or grow in new ways are, are the following. The, the first one is that we are evaluating new strategies and partners uh, to advance these uh, long, I mean, some of our longstanding advocacy priorities. Um, and we're building a bench. Uh, the turnover in Congress, the turnover in this in civil, I, I say the civil civil servants, the turnover at the VA. I mean, you you all see a turnover in in um, in some of the ranks and and even uh, police officer. I mean, police corps and you know things like that. Um, every time that happens, uh, we we start from scratch again, just like you would. I mean, you have to nurture and build relationships. So we have a very targeted plan that we have built. We, we split it amongst the team. We have what we call owners, um, owners for Senate members and House members and uh, agencies and divisions and boards. But it really comes down to really nurturing the relationships and growing, influ and growing influence um, so that we can count on it somewhere down the road. Uh, we're also leveraging technology, uh, our resources, and our expertise to increase impact. Um, what you'll often hear us say is um, the, the right time, the right messenger, um, and the right place. Um, and what we mean by that, and, and with technology as a tool, is that in the, I say in the old days, in the before times, well, I've, I've been hearing that a lot lately in the before times, um, what members often would would say is that they would think that if there had to be a uh, if there was a concern with legislation or a policy or a concern with a regulation, 
they would go right to their congressional mem member and treat it as a federal issue. Uh, what we're doing is we're pausing and we're doing kind of a 360 audit wraparound on the issue and analyzing whether it really makes sense to start at the federal level or if it makes more sense to make constituent contacts at the local or the state level and then build as in a scaffolding, building a scaffolding of, of support from the state up to meet with the federal level. Um, technology is key in, in doing that. Um, we, we did roll out what's called Voter Voice, which, was a, which is a, uh, a targeted uh, kind of an action alert system to the states. That was something that the states, as in the state SPTAs, the state psychology um, uh, associations, they had not had that resource before. So we have been able to give that to them and, and partner with them um, to use that kind of a thing to reach more people with psychology. We are also working on diversifying the voice of psychology um, across disciplines. Um, you will hear us talk about leading with the science. Um, that kind of confuses some scientists. Somebody said, well, why don't you just say that you're out there fighting for more funding? I said, well, we are fighting more, with more funding. What we've been trying to do is, is when we say lead with the science, is we're, we're, we're trying to always formulate our arguments around evidence, um, research that has been done. And we're finding that if we lead with that, we get in a lot, lot more doors. We have a lot, uh, a lot more ears are open for a lot longer. Um, and we're in the game of winning, winning over the hearts and minds who are, are of those who don't necessarily agree with our position. So diversifying that voice is, is very, is very, very um, critical. And also um, this harnessing our desire to address the crisis of the day. Um, uh, you, you as psychologists in Division 18, you've been around the APA a lot longer than I have, yet there really is a cri There could be a crisis a day. There could be several crises a day just because of the vast, uh, and I say vast, the, the, the numbers of disciplines and divisions and boards and committees. Governance structure is pretty big. So what we're trying to do is harness that and trying to keep our eye on the ball or our eye on the prize, we say, uh, which can be a little tricky. Um, yet we know that if we don't do that, um, we won't be able to... Um, you know, come up with come up with um, wins, as we say, or have impact in the end. And finally, um, we're we are growing in new ways by promoting the untapped potential of psychology and deepening this um, our member engagement. And it really does start with um, us connecting directly with divisions like yours. Um, I know Tif Tiffany and I, I'm going to shine a spotlight on you, Tiffany. Um, we, we have signed a couple RFI letters this year already together. Um, I'm completely opening, open to doing that at, at any and all times. Um, it's that kind of impact um, that we just, you know, it, it's there and it's there for the taking. Um, and that deepening of the member engagement and our, and our partnership with you, I think will, will take us all a long way. Okay, so Alex, let's, um, let's move on to talk about how we work. Um, next slide. Let, let's just start with saying, uh, just so everybody has the, uh, a level of comfort here, because uh, every time I talk about how we work, I, I have been in rooms with people and they start bristling, like, oh my gosh, you're going to tell me something that's going to kind of rock, rock my world. Um, I'm just going to say uh, the foundation hasn't changed. Um, there's still the top three pillars here. To do the work that we do, we, we need to do the direct lobbying. We need to do that. We used to call it shoe leather, uh, kind of just hitting hitting the streets kind of lobbying. Uh, it's a, I'm not sure what we call it now because part of it is done in, in the virtual world. Um, we do grassroots. You know, we rely, rely on the connections at the, at the state level and that advocacy to leverage it with our state, with our federal uh, advocacy and the political giving. The psychology pack really really is a must as part of the foundation uh, for having good Im impact in the advocacy arena. Next slide. Uh, the, let's focus a little bit on the 2022 advocacy priorities. Um, for those who, who might be new to this process, um, every other year, um, the advocacy coordinating committee uh, surveys the membership and actually asks them what they believe their advocacy priorities should be. Um, the 2022 advocacy priorities 
stemmed um, from, uh, I think we had over 9,000 individual comments. Um, well, 6,000 people responded with 9,000 comments. So let's, let's, let's think about that. Um, and and what, they, what the advocacy coordinating committee does is they then go through all of that data and, uh, and then look at you know, what, if there's anything that's been left out that's just crucial uh, to uh, APA. Uh, the survey that uh, is the underpinning for the, for the new 2023 priorities uh, was completed earlier this spring. Uh, over 12,000 individuals uh, responded and the advocacy coordinating committee will be meeting in, in about a month uh, to begin going through that data and and looking at what the, you know how the member priorities have shifted. The, the key thing about these 18 is and the, the, you will see 18 priorities here is that they are put into three categories. The first one being priorities that are unique to APA. Um, we, we could call those our bread and butter issues. We could we could call them anything, but they really are unique in that if, if we were not doing them, if we were not representing or advancing psychological science and defending or protecting the pr profession, nobody else would be speaking up for these things for us and for psychology. That's what makes them unique. We bring a unique voice to them. The other categories here are where APA is making a significant contribution. Those are through um, various um, connections with multiple divisions. Um, we can look at like the K, you know, application of psychological science to K-12. Um, we had 18 divisions um, uh, all um, collaborating on an effort about a year ago. The other um, last one is in collaboration with partners. And that's where really we're, we are working with coalitions. Um, we're bringing the psychological science to them to make them their efforts stronger. And by us joining with them, it, um, the entire effort kind of grows from there. So there, those are the three categories that the ACC had recommended to the board back in uh, 2020 uh, that lasted for two years. And like I said, we're gonna be, we're gonna be looking at it um, here again for 2023. So keep in mind, Alex, as you advance to the next slide, keep in mind that this slide that just showed you those 18 priorities. Um, prior to the integration of the advocacy uh, office and the creation of the advocacy office in 2019, um, the way advocacy was approached in APA was in a very siloed fashion. We had the public interest had its own government relations office, education had its own, science had its own, practice had its own. And I can tell you um, in, in my first uh, three or four months uh, back in 19 when I came on board, I was, I was surprised, really surprised that there were individuals on our, my team who had worked uh, close to 20 years at APA in government relations, but they had not met each other before. Um, that's how siloed uh, government relations had been before. So what we did is we brought, I brought them all, all the teams together, and we created a real cross-functional team that is working differently, and we are looking for every opportunity uh, to uh, approach issues in what we say are multi-pronged fashions and the ability to leverage. So let's look at this. Um, it might be a little you know, I hope it's it's not too academic, but I'm just hoping it will shed light on how we do our work and how we have the reach and the impact that we have. Um, we we uh, within the office actually look at all these issues in in four portfolios: uh, practice of psychology and psychology workforce is one, psychology research funding and infrastructure another, health equity and racial justice, and public health and education. And those 18 priorities you saw in the previous slide, we have put them into these new portfolios. And you might say, so what's the what's the big I, what's the big deal about this? We we have, uh, as we call these port portfolios, become centers of excellence. We have hundreds of years of policy expertise on the team, not just government relations expertise, but policy expertise. And that policy expertise cuts across the those. Old, old, those old directorate models. Um, so when we are talking about the practice of psychology and psychology workforce, 
we could have somebody who is an expert in in education we can have we can bring somebody from the practice arena we can bring we do bring somebody from another arena um, we bring everyone together to really enrich in the experience uh, thank you alex uh, so here let's just take telehealth um, as an example like running it through these portfolios um, and and how it enriches uh, uh, our our approach and leverages our approach uh, to advocacy. So if we were to just take an issue, we would say, okay, let's look within the practice of psychology and psychology workforce. Where, where does telehealth really stand out? Well, it stand out, stands out with policy uh, needs as in realignment, new policies, uh, defending of policies in the reimbursement and scope of practice arena, and then workforce development. It does have an impact on, on psychology workforce development. We look at funding. Um, there are funding needs um, for research um, on, on the effects, the impact of, of how telehealth is, you know, maybe changing treatments, maybe changing outcomes. Um, telehealth is very much in the part of, the, I mean, has impacts in the, the future of work, in, in how, how the workforce is changing and actually how employers are, are, are delivering as well. Um, on, on mental health and support in their workplace. Um, I know, I know it, 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 with, the, with the VA, telehealth has been, uh, uh, it's, it, it's kind of a blessing it's, and, and a challenge as well. Um, and if we look at health equity, racial justice, that arena, we know telehealth really pops up, criminal justice, discrimination, uh, safety net issues. And then in the public health and education se sector, telehealth is absolutely an access to health services um, issue. Um, it, it definitely plays in suicide prevention and per, you know, early intervention prevention uh, and violence, um, as well as the health promotion. So you can see by us looking at it and running an issue through all these portfolios, our team, collective team then can see how telehealth isn't just one person being assigned telehealth anymore. Telehealth becomes infused into the work across the pro portfolio and is, in, is impacted and also well-informed in, in many different ways. Next slide. So let's get to the fun part now, which is uh, just talking about, uh, and I say it's a snapshot, there's much more we've been, we've been doing with Division 18 and, and uh, the, the various uh, parts of the division. Um, but this is a snapshot. So let, let's, uh, let's dig in on the partnering uh, with, with everyone. So in the, v, the Veterans uh, Affairs or Disability Issues space, um, so I did mention regulatory comments. We have, we have partnered with the division on four comments so far, reducing co-payments for high risk for suicide vets, increasing veterans outdoor recreation, schedule for rating disabilities and mental disorders, and readjustment counseling service scholarship program. Um, kind of technical, but once we, we dug into them, there were very important uh, things that uh, psychology brought to the table and that um, psychology contributed to these proposed uh, new regulations. Um, the big legislative efforts this year have been really uh, focused on supporting the Strong uh, Veterans Act of 2022, uh, which increases uh, resources for suicide prevention, improves workforce trainings, Title 38 authorities, and increases research funding, and also um, the Ensuring Veterans Smooth Transition Act, um, which, which really at the heart of it is, uh, is uh, the, the, the key trigger there is the automa automatic enrollment of transitioning veterans. And then on the education front, um, we do highlight there um, the webinar, uh, which featured psychologists who had successfully had their debt canceled. And um, we, we really enjoyed partnering um, with the division on this. I think uh, uh, Tiffany and I had talked a little bit about before that um, it, it, it had surprised us not only how many people participated at the time, but just the, the number of, of views of the recorded uh, webinar that have taken place since. Um, and that's the kind of, that is exactly the kind of partnering we like to do. That video has, um, and that recording has become a resource um, and that we hope that can be used again and again. Next slide. Uh, let, me, let me pause and, and talk a little bit about the partnering in the criminal justice and policing area. Um, 
at the top there is the drafting of the Public Safety Officer Act, uh, which is in play right now. It could actually end up being a part of one of the, the I mean, the Senate um, mental health package. That is, uh, that is a bill that would support families of public safety officers who struggle with mental health or, uh, or are lost to trauma-linked suicides. Uh, it does have broad uh, bipartisan support. Um, the other area um, uh, where we have been providing expertise and I would say support and, and I think political insights is probably a better, uh, probably the best way of describing it. Is, is just with the uh, Division 18 members who are serving on APA's pre presidential task force on police to use of force against African-Americans. Um, and and, the, and BIAPI, um, uh, the board uh, also has a working group that's uh, drafting an APA re resolution on policing. Um, those efforts have been ongoing um, for many, many months. Uh, hopefully to come to fruition this year. I think if there are any Division 18 members who are part of that on here, I, I'm thinking they're ready for it to move as well uh, uh, in the right form. Um, uh, so th that's some of the, the spotlight on, on what we've been doing. Alex, you wanna move it one more? Um, I'm gonna tell you about something very exciting here, uh, just because we need your help in finding candidates. Uh, uh, ben Vanaken, um, who's on our team, who, who does a lot of policy work in the, in, in, um, the uh, criminal justice arena, but he also is the director of the, the fellowship program. So it's both the executive branch and the congressional branch. We, we together have been looking for opportunities to try to add fellows um, because they are in such big demand. Um, we, we have congressional offices calling every day looking for psychologists to come in. We've been just trying to try and more or less to figure out how to, I mean, it's the funding part. How do you fund the fellows? Um, we, in talking with SAMHSA and their needs um, uh, to improve the design of state and community beha behavioral health systems, they, they came to us, they have a grant and they have partnered with us to set up a new SAMHSA APA fellowship. Um, this would be starting for one year, could extend to two years. And right now, this is, this is kind of the, 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 not kind of, this is the, uh, this is the job announcement of sorts. Um, uh, and we're, we're trying to recruit, trying to find as many names uh, that SAMHSA can, can look at. Um, and I will also remind everyone who doesn't know that uh, Assistant Secretary uh, Miriam Delphine Rittman is a clinical psychologist. Uh, she is one of our greatest champions, and she is also, as she calls herself, a proud product of the MFP program. That is generally the second thing she says when she's testifying before Congress. Next slide. And uh, finally, before I turn to q and I, I did want to officially introduce someone we have all been waiting for, myself included, uh, for some time. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Karen Conwell-Smith. She goes by Conwell. Uh, Conwell will be starting work with us next Monday. I think that's right. I keep, t I, every Monday I say she's gonna start that Monday and somebody will say, no, it's in another week, but I've been, I've been trying to bring her on board <laughs> fast. Um, but but uh, Conwell is, will be the Senior Director of Congressional and Federal Relations for Military and Veterans Policy. Um, she has a fabulous uh, track record in the in the healthcare arena, um, and she is no stranger to um, veterans and veterans policies. So, Karen, I thought I'd introduce you, and maybe you'd like to say just a few words. Well, I just want to tell everyone how excited I am to join APA and APA's mission uh, as the the proud wife of a of an Army veteran and an extremely proud uh, and doting aunt of both a niece and a nephew serving in, in Germany and South Korea. Uh, I can just tell you that the issues that we're dealing with today are probably more important than they've ever been. Uh, and, and so I think that this focus both on mental health, but also on this population of those serving and those who have served, I just think we're in a very unique time. And so anything I can do to to help the cause and help move us along uh, to make sure that we're protecting that, that population base. Um, you know, I'm, I would just be very proud to work in this arena. So thank you. I look forward to meeting all of you. 
Thank you, Conwell. And and Tiffany, if I can, I did I did want to uh, also introduce Alex Ginsburg officially. Alex is a is a senior senior director uh, for congressional and federal relations as well. And as I mentioned, she's our appropriations as well as our workforce lead. Uh, and on on top of that, uh, she she uh, pretty much runs or leads the the grassroots um, uh, apparatus and the um, the new the new office for for engagement that we have. So Alex, I thought I'd call on you just to say a few words if you'd like. Thank you. So happy to be here and just want to say, um, you know, how grateful I am for the strong partnership that APA has had with Division 18 historically, and we're looking forward to growing it into new areas. I've had some really great conversations with Stif with Stephanie. Steph Tiffany, sorry, we have a colleague who was on previously whose name was Stephanie, um, just about our historical relationship with Division 18 and creating new opportunities that don't kind of place in parts of the divisions in certain boxes and look, you know, being, making sure that we're always having conversations in terms of figuring out what new interests that the divisions are uh, interested in getting involved in. There's been such a strong working uh, relationship between APA, Division 18, and our military veterans issues in particular, but we're looking forward to growing those other areas of ad see with you all. Um, and also, I think very much to some degree replicating the type of relationship that we have with Division 18 with other divisions across APA who we don't have um, the same kind of strong relationship with. So I'm really grateful for you, both your advocacy work and also work to support our grassroots efforts and trying to replicate that model with other divisions just because it's been so great across APA. So thank you. Happy to be here today. So Tiffany, I will turn it back to you. Okay, uh, I really appreciate this overview and even the, um, I wasn't expecting this, that how, how you work, um, how the advocacy office works and it's very interesting and it seems much more integrated and better, you know, it seems like um, much more effective that way. And as you were going through all of the, or the 2022 advocacy priorities, so many of them hit on things that our members even um, report it during our fall membership survey, um, like access to mental health services, psychology workforce development, criminal justice, health equity, reimbursement and scope of practice. Those are some major issues that came up in our membership survey. So I'm really happy to see that overall APA also is having this focus. So I think mo many more ways that we might be partnering together um, to strengthen messaging or strengthen those advocacy efforts. Yeah. Um, but I don't want to do all the talking because uh, we have some other people attending. So is this, do you want to open it up to Q&A? Sure. Absolutely. And please, you, please turn, turn your cameras on. We'd love, we'd love to see you. There's some familiar faces there. Um, so any 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 questions or or I would say observations? Let's let's go with that. Um, Tiffany said she learned a little bit more about how we work, but that was really different. Um, um, but I any anything that you have on your mind? I, I do have some questions if, if other people don't. Oh, Brad, it looks like Brad has a hand up. Okay. Um, am I unmuted? Yes. <laughs> okay, great. Um, I'm currently a federal employee. Uh, previously, I was working in the prison system in California and was active in the uh, political and legislative affairs committee of one of the unions there. Is there uh, coordination or uh, efforts to partner with, say, union memberships doing politi political action, say, psychologists from those AFSCMEs and AFGE, et cetera, so that there's kind of like a, a, a synergy between those efforts to kind of redouble the um, lobbying perhaps in messaging uh, that psychologists want to get across in their legislative priorities? Brad, I think that's a, that's a great question. I, I would answer it by saying there, there's absolutely opportunity uh, to partner 
with those groups. Uh, what uh, what gets a little tricky is, um, and I'll just say tricky as in just us doing a good um, good due diligence uh, before we enter into a partnership is 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 example one of the examples like Title Thirty Eight. Um, uh, we we have run into you know some union union opposition of of sorts. Um, their, their uh, collective bargaining specifically, um, some of the agreements, I mean, concerns about them. And so sometimes um, um, definitely we could, we could have them as partners. I can, I can tell you like with AFSME, um, uh, I, I have been in rooms and at the table with them uh, during COVID, especially as, as um, psychological science has been really informing um, some of the return to work issues, as well as the uh, telehealth and you know burnout on camera, all these various things, and and some of the employee unions have been very interested in in learning uh, more, getting more steeped in in the substance of those things. Um, but I, I I don't rule it out. How's that, Brad? I don't I don't rule it out. Um, I can't say we have. Uh, I can't say we have uh, put the put some of the unions on the list, you know, kind of like right front and center to go partner with. Um, but but uh, our team is regularly pushing ourselves to uh, kind of we we say go where go where you're least expected. Uh, develop partners with um, people that you may not have partnered with before. So Brad, if you if you have an idea on an issue where you think it might be good for us to partner or pursue that, um, we're open to that. Thank I'll, you. Um, add on to um, what, what Catherine just uh, just mentioned, whereas where um, I think there probably is some overlap in terms of issues, because I know one issue that has come up, I'm not um, the staff who's covering this issue, but I know I am aware of it peripherally that there are some issues involving loan forgiveness and um, qualifying for loan forgiveness, certain types of loan forgiveness while working in correctional facilities and bureau issues related to bureau of prisons. So I think there probably must be some overlap in terms of um, our portfolio and the, the, the work of these unions too on these issues, I would imagine. So we appreciate you bringing that um, example up well, because I, I, go um, ahead. I can actually, if you want, I can give you a great example of that. Yes. So yeah, I applied for the National Health Service Corps Mm -hmm. repayment program while working in the state prison and uh, worked there for nearly 16 years that didn't completely pay off my loans but now that I've transferred to work for the Veterans Administration as a federal employee um, the first position I took did not have uh, they call it EDRP um, but the new position that I just took does so there's a second way to get another crack at getting the remainder of my student loans paid for. So that's both a state issue and a federal issue. Um, and thankfully I'm being able to benefit from two different programs um, that um, are, can be a huge impact on the bottom line in terms of the loan, uh, the debt, level that a psychologist might take out, especially nowadays when the educations are kind of crazily expensive. Uh, that's really great to know. Thank you for telling us about that. I might actually, um, if you don't mind, put you in touch with um, Kenneth Polishchuk, Polishchuk who, who this work, this group has worked with on pu public service loan forgiveness, but he also covers other loan forgiveness programs like our uh, National Health Service Corps, for example. So we'd love to learn a little bit more about your experience, uh, just in case we hear of any others that are that uh, are, are sort of face the same problem as you did. I'd be more than happy to provide whatever insight I can. Thank you so much. I'll make I'll make one final comment, and that's going back to AFSCME and the in the Union for Behavioral Health um, Providers, and we 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 have engaged and we continue to engage with them um, on uh, a, a great piece of legislation that was that was introduced um, uh, by I can't remember I just went blank, but it was the it was called the uh, Closing Health Coverage Gaps for Public Servants Act, and at the heart of that was um, you know, people who work in public service and also those who are on the front lines of COVID uh, response every single day. I mean, we, we, we should be, you know, getting rid of any discriminatory kind of loopholes and ensuring that they, they have equal access to mental health and substance treatment themselves too. Because um, that, that was a gap that was, that was 
just a fascinating one that Congress had had brought to our attention um, was the uh, the frontline essential workers, including psychologists, who were determined to be frontline essential. We'd worked on that to get that done, but that they that the the toll that had you know the pandemic had taken on psychologists as well as others, and that there were gaps in coverage and treatment for them. Um, so it was kind of a, a a parody issue. But AFSME has been very active in that. Just wanted to raise that up. Any other questions from um, any other members of the group? I had a question. I'm brand new to Division 18, so thank you all for inviting me to this. Um, I'm from Idaho, not originally, but I'm on the public sector. I'm the public sector rep there, and we had a meeting last night. It was brought up uh, during our meeting that um, throughout the state of Idaho, and this could be a state level issue, but I guess I just would like some help with maybe knowing how to categorize this. Um, what what area of advocacy this could fall under, mm -hmm. um, but there has been a reduction in the number of intermediate care facilities for individuals with intellectual disabilities. Um, and partly that's uh, due to the facilities being understaffed and those under those facilities being understaffed is also due to just insufficient um, pay. So I think it's taking uh, the state of Idaho a while to uh, increase their pay to kind of match the new uh, cost of living in our community. And so um, I guess we were trying to figure out and we had no idea where to go from here, but how can we access money? <laughs> what kind of, um, I guess, what our opportunities could be or what avenues can we go down with that issue? Um, that isn't an issue that, not to say it's not a federal federal issue, it's one that hasn't necessarily trickled up yet, and then all, all issues start from somewhere, so this could be that, that pivot point right now. Um, and I would say that, you know, kind of issues uh, when, in a ter when in terms of facilities, issues uh, having to do with individuals with disabilities, perhaps related to Medicare, a lot of this funding does flow through Medicare, there's usually some kind of federal state aspect to it, so it's probably not either or, it's probably both. Um, but you're pursuing the right uh, kind of um, route right now and working with your Idaho Psych Association. A lot of the, I know, I don't know how long you've been a member of um, the Idaho Psych Association. Uh, a lot of these psych associations have uh, individual lobbyists that work on state level issues that'll be able to figure out to what degree the issue is a state issue versus a federal issue. So I'm sure, I'm not sure if Idaho has one, I would suspect probably yes, uh, but that individual will be a good uh resource for that. And then we can also loop in with the Idaho Federal Advocacy Coordinator. So that's the person that has been selected by the Idaho Psych Association to kind of be a liaison between APA and the SBTA on issues. So we'd be happy to kind of come at it from that angle too, just to loop in. Um, a lot of the times these federal advocacy coordinators, they have a great deal of advocacy experience and they understand the dynamics and the interplay between what's a federal issue versus what's a state issue better than we do, just looking kind of from the top down. So we'd be happy to look uh, to loop in with our with the Idaho FAC to to figure it out or just to, maybe just to learn more information on it. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah, I know her. I know the FAC personally, <laughs> and I'm on the advocacy committee, so I'll just take that advice and bring it to that next meeting we have. So thank you. Perfect. And and, and we we do have a, a great legal counsel on staff, and he has a fabulous background. His name is Andrew Strickland, but he's he is he's uh, his background is in disability and Medicaid. Medicare policy. So um, he, if we had him on here, he would probably say yes quickly. Try to he could give you a little bit more. But we'll, like Alex said, we'll we'll make sure we connect up with that, with the right people. Connect you with the right people. Any other questions for any of our team today before we sign off? We have a few more minutes. I have a question if no one else does. 
just kind of just logistics. I know here in Division 18, we do have a policy and advocacy committee and our, excuse me, <coughs> sorry, co-chairs are Erica Lee and Sarah Roan. Um, and so we're in there building a more robust committee. But I'm curious if members of the division do have things that they want to, you know, make inquiries to you all about, what do you think is the most, I guess, the ideal pathway, like maybe to work through our committee and, and go up from there? Or, or do you prefer a more direct approach? Imagine you might be getting calls and emails all the time from people. So just want to make sure we do the most streamlined and, you know, right. appropriate you know. So we, we, we're, we are in the midst of, of standing up a new, it's called Division Advocacy Partners uh, program, it, which is to try to do exactly what, what you're uh, alluding to, Tiffany, which is, is, is trying to, uh, number one, which is better track um, the division requests or the uh, need for assistance, uh, track them coming in, and then also us internally tracking who's handling them um so that so that we're in a timely manner responding um where alex where alex sits alex alex shop is is uh being established to be kind of that intake um for for those division requests um i am my door is always open i'm just going to tell you that my my door is always open um i if anyone needed to e email um I, uh alex's door is open but i'm like go ahead and email me if you've got a question about something i'm i i can be a great radio uh air traffic controller i can get you to the right person if i if i don't have an uh, have an answer for you um i i uh, going back to uh, alex a while ago had said um our our work with division 18 is actually a model of of success um we have had an incredibly high level of bi-directional communication across the division uh, with members. And, and um, I think the other thing that's, that we have felt is that it's been a, uh, it, it might sound strange to say, but it's been just very uh, collegial and respectful. Um, it's, we, we, don't, we don't feel like we're getting a lot of request, uh, requests over and over. I mean, it's very selective. Uh, very, you know, I mean, I, I can see that the, the division's done its work by way of, 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 of coming up with its priorities, um, which is always very helpful because then we can look for opportunities to try to advance priorities with you. Um, there's, there's always room for improvement. I mean, well, if you've, if you've got any ideas on, on how we're kind of not doing as well as we could in some areas, please pass that on as, as well. Um, but, uh, I, I thoroughly enjoy myself having um, a good, um, just open door policy with, with the presidents of the divisions. Um, just so they, sometimes it's just checking in to see what's going on because there's so much flying by every day. I'd like to add on to, um, to what Catherine is mentioning. So she mentioned our division advocacy partner program uh, that we launched. And we actually uh, had a conversation with you, Tiffany, about this earlier, uh, earlier this year. And so you all made the decision to actually just go ahead and name your two policy co-chairs as leads for the division advocacy partner program. Um, so in terms of the information, how that would flow, the information should flow that if there's a member of your division who's interested in some kind of advocacy issue, the request to us should flow through uh, either one of those co-chairs slash kind of division, division advocacy partners. Um, and in terms of modeling, this is another way that we've tried to model or replicate kind of our division with our, our relationship with division 18. We've had uh, questions from other divisions about who among their division would be most appropriate to serve in this liaison role as division advocacy partner partner program. Um, and so we've used you all as a model in discussing that as well, that kind of if you have a policy committee, not all divisions do have policy committees, but those serving on the policy committees, either as leads or at least or elsewhere, are kind of the most natural fit in terms of who would be the best type of liaison for a division advocacy partner. Um, but we asked probably that just on from your end and from our end that the information flow through those co-chairs. And, and I think that's actually probably how it's worked in the past. So it won't be much of a shift for you all. But just so that you have members in your division that have have a broader sense of what all the issues that everybody is working on or everybody's interested in. Somehow that inf information is just kept within one or two individuals for continuity. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. 
And then we, we also joke that whoever those two people are, we, we have to make sure it, it, it goes back. It's on you to have a good re working relationship with them. <laughs> we've, we've had some interesting examples where we've, we've, we've had uh, good divisions contact us and ask us, do you know what our, do you know what our priorities are? Because, you know, so-and-so uh, left this year, we didn't, we weren't left with any kind of transition memo. Um, and we, I mean, we know how that goes. We work, we we're, we work at APA. So we, it, it, it's a big organization, so uh, it's it's just it's a little humorous at times. So Tiffany, thank you for, again for inviting us. Uh, I will I'll just uh, double down and say how much we appreciate the partnership we have with Division 18, all all parts, all sections of Division 18, and we look forward to doing big things together and having impact. I feel the same. Thank you all so much for your time. Um, really appreciate the work you're doing. And yes, uh, hopefully this collaboration efforts will continue. Yes. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you. Bye, everyone.